presence of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. We thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you that, Jesus, you are the revelation, God, of grace to overcome this world. You are the revelation, God, of freedom, of deliverance, of hope, God, of life, God, and that life more abundantly. We thank you that, Jesus, to this generation, that you are the revelation, God, that they can overcome, that, God, that they are more than conquerors, that, God, that they are not bound to the limitations of natural things in this world. And so we ask that today that the grace of God would empower this generation to rise, empower this generation, God, to get up and to walk, God, purpose and call. We declare today, God, that this generation is separated to you, to your purpose and your plan. We thank you that, Holy Spirit, that you're raining down from heaven righteousness, God, that you're raining down from heaven the revelation, God, of the righteous standard, of the right way of living, God, of the right way of communicating, the right way of doing life, God. We thank you that, God, today that Jesus is the perfect image of God to the world. And we declare today that you are transforming young people into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ, that they are being transformed, that they are becoming the sons and the daughters of the Most High. We declare today that this generation, God, is separated to you, to your plan and your purpose. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd raise up a generation, God, that is not familiar and not common to what is normal in this culture, God, a generation that God is far above, God, all the powers and principalities and all the things of darkness. We thank you that you've given to them in Jesus Christ, a name that is above of every other name, God, that in them, God, Jesus dwells and has his, his power and his dominion, God, in them. We declare today that there's a generation that's been strengthened by the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit in their inner man, God. Though outwardly, God, things are perishing, God, on their inner man, God, on the inner being of this generation, they're being strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that today that there's a revelation of love, God, that is deeper, that is higher, that is wider, that is greater than anything else in this culture. We thank you that a revelation of love for this generation, the love of God that has been shed abroad by the Holy Spirit that is awakening this generation from its slumber, from its sleep, God, to purpose and destiny. We declare this generation, God, is being able to test the, the length and the depth and the width of your love, God, that nothing can separate them, nothing can separate them from that love. We declare today, God, that this generation, God, is being separated to purpose and call and plan and that they cannot be separated from that call or that purpose because of the strategies of this world. We declare today that your love has the power to demolish perversion. Your love has the power to demolish anger and wrath, God. Your love has the power, God, to destroy, God, and demolish. God, every exalted thing, every high thing, God, we declare that all those things are brought into subject of the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. We declare that there is a word upon this generation, God. God, a word that is declared over this generation, God, that is declared to them to, the, to be that generation, that God has wisdom and revelation through the knowledge of Jesus. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten the eyes of the heart of this generation, that they would be, be able to see clearly and walk out clearly your purpose and your plan. We declare today this generation has eyes wide open to see the goodness of God, to see the mercy of God, to see the will and the intention of God. We declare today this generation is being awakened from its slumber, that it would walk its purpose and its call. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Matt. That's awesome. You may be seated. Welcome, everyone, online. We're so glad you could join us. And we're thankful for uh, the instruction of the Lord. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? The instruction of the Lord is, is everything. Because when we, when we receive the instruction of the Lord, it's already done. We know that we're just lining up with eternity. Isn't that right? Well, today we want to uh, teach uh, on something that I know a lot of young people, well, and adults too, but especially young people deal with, and that's condemnation. And there's a real lack of understanding between condemnation and conviction. And so most people end up chucking out either all conviction or just being full of condemnation and not knowing the difference, just receiving everything that is being thrown at them, and so we want to, uh, Pastor Tracy and I are going to uh, talk to you today about the difference between these um, things. Uh, many times, um, condemnation, uh, ha 
well, every time, really, you would reject anything the, the devil has to say if it didn't have a part of truth in it. Isn't that right? So it sounds very familiar. Sounds like, yep, that's true. Uh, I did do that. Um, but there is, there is no way out. The end result of condemnation is that you're a failure. God can't use you. God doesn't love you anymore. And there is no escape. It's amazing uh, how many people are completely in despair over that. But the Bible says that Jesus said he came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now, this is really the heart of, of the Lord, isn't it? He ev With everything he tells us, it's in order to bring salvation to that area of our lives. I love that. He's such a good father. And many times when I have been under condemnation, God uses my position as a mother to get me out of that. Would you do that towards your child? No. And he's much better, right? He, uh, we, you, we would not for months hold something over the head of our child. That's abusive, right? But many times we think God does that to us. And so we have a generation that's either one way or another. And it can get pretty brutal out there, especially on I internet, right? You can see people completely rejecting all conviction of the Holy Spirit. Any standards are, are uh, frowned upon because people don't want to feel condemned. The, the excessive, um, uh, broad, sweeping movement of grace that is uh, not really God's grace. It's a form of that, that, that guilty people... <laughs> have created in order not to feel bad about their lifestyle anymore. And the thing is, even though Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to save us from something and bring us into something. And so he has a plan and he has a standard for us that is very high. And um, I was talking to, uh, to uh, one of the ladies that I mentor yesterday and, you know, uh, a lot of people are upset right now that churches are embracing homosexual marriage, uh, homosexual relationships, and these kinds of things. But when you think about it deeply, what can you do as a powerless church? Not able to set the captives free, right? What can you do? You can either reject and hate them or love and accept them, right? And, and approve their sin, because you can't set them free from it. So then you have to say it's not sin. And we do the same thing in our lives. We, we, we reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit when we feel powerless to do something about it. Okay. So uh, while we're teaching this, I would really like for you to have in mind that we need to te teach our children and youth this. If you have any sphere of influence with any youth or or uh, children, make sure that you teach them the difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction is very, very important because uh, uh, my husband was sharing this week, uh, it's like your nervous system. If you had no nervous system, it's like people who have, uh, what do you call that, a disease. Often in Africa, they have leprosy. They don't feel anything. So they're constantly injuring their extremities and things get burned and cut off and, and injured and bruised and the nerve endings are not alive. So things start just rotting off. It's the same if we have no conviction of the Holy Spirit. We end up injuring ourselves all the time and there's a numbness where the life of the Spirit of God doesn't flow into those areas anymore and it just starts to rot away. There's no life of the spirit. And so uh, conviction is so powerful, but conviction is not condemnation. And why are they so similar? Because they both speak about something that you have done. They both speak about something. You know, the Bible says, agree quickly with your adversary. And uh, I love that scripture when it talks about the devil uh, being our adversary, I love that we should quickly agree with our adversary if he is right. There's no point saying, no, I didn't steal that cookie, devil. 
when you did steal the cookie. So quickly agree with him. Yes, I did steal the cookie. And then turn to your father and say, Father, I stole a cookie. Will you please forgive me? <laughs> I receive your power never to do that again. I receive uh, your image of me that I am a giver and not a stealer. Come on. <laughs> I'm not a stealer for sure. Those stealers, they stole our, our, um, our game. And uh, Remember? So anyway, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about football. Everybody's like, what? Um, so, so, um, quickly agree if it's true, but then it's between you and your father. It doesn't need to be between you and the devil. Come on now. And so you turn to the father and you deal with your sin or you're falling short, missing the mark. And, and he will gladly forgive you what you confess. Come on now. Cause he wants you and him to be right. And for there to be nothing in between. Isn't that right? And so um, I, uh, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Did you want to jump in there already? Not yet. Romans 8 verse 1. I love that. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but after the spirit. This is amazing. Now, does that mean that you don't ever make mistakes? No, of course, it doesn't mean that. But you're on a path walking in the spirit. Amen. You're not on a path wanting to walk in the flesh. That, that's the difference. And, uh, and then it says um, in Revelation 12 verse 10 that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the, he is our accuser. So he will never stop doing that until the end comes. Amen. So we have to understand that we will always have to decipher between what he's saying and what the Holy Spirit is saying. If we think that we don't have any accusation in our life, then we probably are living under condemnation. But he's speaking all the time. And the, the way you know the difference is that God will never tear down your identity in him, ever. Never. He may address something that, that in your actions that needs to change or an attitude, but he will never say, you filthy whatever, you know. <laughs> the devil, however, he comes in order to tear you down. The last thing he wants is for your identity in Jesus to be strong. Amen? That's where he's coming after. When he's nitpicking at things, it's because he wants you to change your mind about yourself. So here we have Jesus. He gets baptized in water. The Holy Spirit descends on him. A voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God, the father loved him. He hadn't done any miracles, so they didn't have anything to do with that. Right? He didn't even have a whole bunch of disciples or anything. He wasn't like a great leader yet. So it didn't have anything to do with that. But his heart was for his father and his father's heart was for him. They loved one another. So then the Holy Spirit says, okay, it is time for you to be tempted by the devil. So he's led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, uh, and what does the devil do? He comes and he attacks his identity, doesn't he? And so this is all for our example. He says, if you are the son of God, because he obviously heard that too, right? This is my beloved son. If you are the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. Amen. Now, what I love about it is that Jesus constantly just zooms out. You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. Well, throw yourself off the temple and the angels will come and catch you. If you are the son of God, you know, if not, then you won't. Then you're just a regular person. Um, and so he zooms out again and he, sa he says, it's written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Amen. So he just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, all these, all, every time that he, he accuses him and tempts him, he comes against his identity. In everything that the devil does, he did this with Eve too. He comes against the identity of the father in her mind, right? He's keeping something from you. He doesn't want you to be wise like him. 
He wants you to, you know, just be stupid and, and whatever. And so she fell for it because she didn't have a zoomed out picture of the father's heart. And so if we understand that God is good to us and that he only has the best for us, even and especially when we've messed up, come on, then we will hear his instruction. We will feel his nudging and we will feel his tugging of getting off of that direction and and following him again. The Bible says in um, Isaiah 30, verse 18, therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. And if we long to be right with him, uh, he's just waiting in heaven to be gracious to us. <laughs> he's just sitting there on the edge of his throne waiting for us to say, Father, <laughs> right? Isn't that wonderful? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Love that. Love that. Romans 2 verse 4, or despise, despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. Isn't that amazing? So it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And he, he is not going to show himself as a bad father. Amen. But he's going to show us himself as a good father because he wants his goodness to lead us to repentance. Praise the Lord. So good. Hallelujah. So what's the difference? Conviction shows you the answer, which is the blood of Jesus and the, the goodness of the father that washes away sin. While condemnation only shows you the problem. The problem with you is your sin, your weakness. You're powerless to change anything. This is your past. These are your failures. And so you, the condemnation keeps you stuck in the weakness that you have instead of empowering you and opening your eyes to see how you can climb out of that thing. Isn't that amazing? So condemnation shouts, your past, your sins, you, you are a loser. Conviction shouts, Confess because the blood of Jesus washes away your sins. Come to Jesus. Be forgiven of your sins. You can be forgiven. Your sins in your past have no part of you anymore. Amen? I don't remember it. So beautiful. So the nature of God's goodness, if we hold that in front of us, we won't fall into condemnation. So I've, it's very important that we teach our children constantly about the goodness of God. Amen? That God is better than all of us. That's what you always say. God is better than us. So he wants to show himself as better than us. Let's see. Conviction. Conviction is also known in the Bible as godly sorrow. Isn't that beautiful? Godly sorrow. <laughs> not fleshly sorrow. Not like pity sorrow. But God's word tells us that godly sorrow leads us to repentance, that you're, you feel bad about it. We can't, like, not feel bad about it because you just fell short of something, right? And so you feel bad about, oh, that falls short of the glory of God in me. Um, and so con condemnation says you're a failure, but God says, come to me, I'll forgive you, and I'll lift you. God is all about lifting us all the time back to who we are. And he understands the process of renewing our minds from who we used to be to who we are now. It takes some time to renew our minds, amen, that that's not who I am anymore. This is who I, who I am. So conviction always uh, shows you who you really are and that that doesn't belong in, in my life, amen? So good. Revelations 12, verse 10. This is the voice of condemnation. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength 
and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, conviction is not day and night. Conviction, the Holy Spirit will tell you, and then he believes that you will listen to him. He may remind you again later, but it's not a nagging thing. Whereas the enemies, his voice is a nagging voice in the back of your head all the time. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, wah, wah. Sometimes you don't even know what's wrong. You just don't feel right. It's because that voice is just on repeat. It's a constant nagging thing. The Lord talks to us like a father. Amen. He's not going to sit there and nag at us all day long. He calls us up higher and then he waits to pour out his goodness on us. Amen. <laughs> so amazing. You just have to jump in whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> ah. So another common tactic of the enemy that we see uh, all the time uh, is the accusing spirit is an anti-Christ spirit. It uh, it talks to people with no love. Um, it, there's a tone, a, a tone that is completely void of the love of God, void of everything that Jesus is. Amen. When you have a right image of God. So when I think about Jesus, I think about him. Yes, according to the word of God, but mo more than what I saw him do, I, I relate to what I've experienced with him. The times that he's danced with me, the times when he is, is laughing with me, the times that he sings over me, the times when he just revealed himself to me because I was going through something. Amen. Uh, just uh, so in all those times, he was only good. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. He doesn't at all sound like that voice, doesn't does he? He doesn't sound like that voice because he's an antichrist spirit. He he sounds completely different. He brings you low. He brings you into heaviness and depression. When condemnation comes, there is a heaviness that comes with it. When conviction comes, it almost like zeal comes with it. You know, the Bible says in in Revelations, be zealous. And repent. So, so that conviction of the Holy Spirit comes with a zeal to say, yes, I'm going to climb higher. <laughs> I am, I'm not going to do that anymore because that's not who I am. Ah, I see it, Lord. I see who you are. And I, I compare uh, my ways, the way I've been living in the past, the way I have been uh, thinking to you and I choose you. I choose the image that I see in this mirror of the word. Isn't that wonderful? And so everything that is of Christ brings hope and salvation and healing and deliverance and a way out. The Bible says also with every temptation that comes, he, he gives a way out. There's always a way out. The voice of condemnation says there is no way out. Now that you have done this, you're forever marked. That's what he says. Now you will always be known as this. Nobody will want to marry you. Nobody will want to be with you. You're forever just unclean or rotten or whatever. And so he marks your identity. That's an antichrist spirit because Jesus came to save us and to remember our sins no more and to make us a new creation. All the old passed away. Amen? And so the Antichrist spirit is completely contrary to that. He makes you feel awful and in a permanent state of, of just sin. Permanent state. Always tainted. Always affected. So it's, it's beautiful. Uh, the other thing that the voice of condemnation does is it encourages you to try harder next time. <laughs> Whereas the voice of Christ says, my grace is sufficient for you. <laughs> I will empower you, and it's a free gift. Amen? Oh, I love it. And But the voice of condemnation will, will, will get you all busy in this rat race of trying to figure out 
How to break this habit? How do I stop doing this? H how, how can I change this? And it causes you to lie because you don't want that identity, so you lie about your condition because there's no way out. So what else can you do? You can only lie about it then. You can only hide it. You can only cover it with more darkness. But, but the spirit of Christ is not like the Antichrist spirit. It just says, here's my free gift of forgiveness. Here's my free gift of redemption. Here's my free gift of restoration. And here's my free gift of newness of life. It's amazing. And it's a free gift. And so that's a big uh, point that you have to know, the difference between the two voices, condemnation, antichrist, and, and conviction, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Those are the two differences. One has no grace, and the other one is all about grace and justification. So beautiful. <laughs> so 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So it, this, is, this is such an intense thing. So there's people and preachers out there that are workers of this Antichrist spirit. And will always preach condemnation. And will always preach, you got to try harder. Amen? Instead of putting on Christ, they say you got to work harder at it. You filthy, whatever. I like to use that word. Filthy. I like to say that to the devil. Shut your filthy mouth. Come on. That's the Amsterdam in me. That's right. <laughs> so the accusing spirit... The, the goal is to tear apart your faith in the Father, your trust in the Father, and the identity uh, that he has given us. He wants you to walk in guilt, never feeling uh, worthy of God's glorious plan for your life, and to wear you down until you're weak and tired. Amen? It, it thrives on past failures. Uh, that's why it's very important not to let your children uh, and youth Bring up the past all the time. Yeah, but I used to, but I used to. Or even for yourself, because God doesn't dwell in that. He, for, he has forgotten it. Amen? It's in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. But the spirit of accusation always wants you to remember it because it's all he has to work with. Amen? Because if he would come and tell me, hey, the other day when you robbed that bank, you fouled you know, rotten thief. It's like, what? You wouldn't even consider such a thing. That's like, wow, I must have had pizza or something. But, but he brings up things of your past that, that God forgave you from. Because he hangs out by that shore of the sea forgetfulness. <laughs> and he makes his little notes. Amen? And he watches the whole time. And, you know, so many times we even condemn ourselves when we did fall into a trap. But the father knows that the enemy has been watching our family patterns for many generations. He's been around for a long time. Those are familiar spirits, right? They're familiar with your granny and your great-granny and what your great-great-granny did and how, how your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather did, did it. And, and so they come, they're, they're, they're um, cunning, and they come and try to trap you in that same thing. Now, th when you trip and fall, the father's not going to kick you and say, you dummy, you fell for it. No, he knows that Satan is very cunning. Amen? He knows it. He knows it. But when we run to the Holy Spirit and ask him to help us, he will, he will always lead us away from those traps. Because he was there even before those familiar spirits were there. He's the ancient of days. And so he knows how to bring us out and how to bring us through. There's always a way out. I'm going to let you talk. That was good. Very good. Um, as someone who experienced and lived in and walked in and constantly battles condemnation, uh, it's very important to know 
know how to recognize the condemnation, which you described very well. Um, condemnation is associated to people who have rejection issues, um, perfection issues, specifically <laughs> perfection issues. Yeah. And the more of a perfectionist you are, the more you are leaning, you will lean towards the condemnation. Because even though you know God is good, you will tell yourself, but you are not deserving of his goodness. Yeah. It's more about your self-talk than it is about your God talk, what you're saying about God. And so you have this, this image of yourself that you have forgotten. And so I think Peter, you know, Peter is an amazing person to study. If you study Peter's life and how much trouble he got in with Jesus and you see how many, you know, he's the only one that Jesus ever had to say, get behind me, Satan. Well, that's pretty intense. You could sleep with that and wake up with nightmares with <laughs> Jesus, Jesus telling you, get behind me, Satan. And then when you, and then, right, you have, there's a lot of visitations of that. The enemy can use that over and over and over to visit you. Um, there's other circumstances that Peter did, right, that he could have visit him over and over and over, walking on the water. And then all of a sudden sinking on the water, right? Um, you know, he, he, you could probably count the one out of 10 times that Peter does something successful. <laughs> one, and then 10 times he's rebuked, right? You're the son of God. Woo! And I mean, he just threw a guess out there. Yes, that's right. But then, you know, you, you're, you're like, okay, uh, sh shut up and sit down, right? He, the next thing he gets, well, he can have. You can have this. And the, I love what the Lord says. He says, this is what I'm going to build my church on. Yeah. <laughs> this revelation. Is this revelation is what I'm going to build my church on. The fact that you can be on one moment and then be totally off the next moment. And I'm still going to walk with you. He didn't say, Peter, get away from me. You go over there. You are now on the stupid team. He didn't put Peter on the stupid team. I would have. I mean, I but he didn't. He said, now this is what we do. We walk together. And he walked with Peter, right? He walked with Peter. Peter, I mean, Peter, you know, is the only one complaining about whether or not he can go fishing at the right time. When Jesus says, go fishing and put it on this other side, and he's, he's questioning the Lord. Yeah. I mean, who else is doing that? Did you see anybody else in Nobody the Bible doing else. it? This is Peter. I mean, could you like after Jesus dies on the cross, could you could you have some visitation of a of an enemy telling you all about the things that you've done? Yes. You wake up with dreams and nightmares and can and, and condemnation is going to visit then or or Peter, you know. Peter denying at the at the crow, the cock crowing uh, three times. I mean, the denial. I mean, Peter had some amazing issues. Yeah. Chopping off his and ear. he Peter's issue was condemnation. You can read it throughout the books of Peter and realize that this man has conquered condemnation. Yeah. He has conquered the revelation that uh, he is accepted even though he made some major mistakes. Yeah, so that would be good to go through with your children and youth, First and Second Peter. First and Second Peter, go through it, but I would say first go through. Give a history lesson. Go through all of the mistakes of Peter. Yeah. And, why, and ask the question, like when you first see Peter, the first person that, Peter wasn't the first outspoken person when when all the way up until the time where it was the breaking of the bread and the feeding of 5000. Peter was a silent individual. It was just after that when he when he he was activated when Jesus came from that moment and walked on the water and Peter was on the boat and he saw something amazing. And that's when he started talking up. And from that moment, he never stops talking. But he wasn't saying anything when it was breaking the five that breaking the bread. He didn't say anything prior to that. He yeah. was completely. But then he, because he was building his nerve, right? The, he was already insecure. He was yeah. already in his own inward focus. That's the only reason you don't speak up. only reason you don't talk. only reason you don't involve yourself is because you're focusing inwardly. What are they going to think? What are they going to say? What are they gonna, so you have this already improper evaluation system yes. Yes. of yourself. Does this yes. make sense? Yes. The people that, are con have, that the devil knows he can get with condemnation are people who evaluate over are oversensitive in evaluating themselves. Right. They're over they're exaggerated in in analyzing their internal person. Yes. Right? They're constantly microscoping yourself, right? Yes. Well that person is a prime candidate of condemnation because you are already busy with yourself inwardly. 
right? Right. So the key is to get outside of yourself. Yes. To think outwardly towards others, to think outwardly. So that immediately starts to take away some of his 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 throttle, Strategy. right? His his yeah. fuel. And when you are able to reach out and when you're able to encourage your children to reach out and you're able to encourage your children not to think about themselves in this moment and think about someone else, when they would want to think about themselves in this very prime moment where it's all about them and get them to think about something else, we're breaking condemnation mm -hmm. because we're breaking the very root system that condemnation needs to ride on, Yes, which is selfishness. It needs, to, it needs that, which is all of us have it. It's not that we don't have it. But Peter says something, and I just there's just two two scriptures, two thoughts I want to give you, but but deal with rejection, yeah. Deal with rejection, and one of the one of the assignments of the devil is to be pull peers around to reject someone for the sake of them wanting to now be accepted, and in that acceptance they will do whatever it takes to please the peers, and then they will they will get tear down their own identity in the Lord that way, right? They they will get hooked in yeah. to pushing through every form of conviction to be with their peer. To even, pa yeah, push past Right, that. so it starts yeah. with a condemnation yeah. that says, you know, belittling, rejection, that makes them want to feel like pulling back. But then there's a moment of acceptance be in, because that person starts to work on themselves to be accepted by their peers. Then they're accepted by their peers. Then they get convicted because the peers are drawing them somewhere and then they push away conviction for in the order sake to of continue the right so condemnation can push you towards peers and away from god yes right and to the point that you don't feel conviction so you're trying to get your acceptance from people from instead people of from and the not father from the lord because that's broken yeah from the condemnation your acceptance because, yeah of the father feels broken yeah. So that needs to be restored, but instead they try to get that acceptance from, from peers. From peers. My acceptance from my father not being there, right? My father was not there to even accept me. Right. So my relationship with the Lord God Father uh, was all about a perfectionism, about being perfect for him, showing him that I can be perfect, revealing myself as a perfect <laughs> child. Trying to convince him to... The, to accept me more, with you. Yeah. but but the realization <laughs> is I had to come to the place that he already fully accepted me. That he's never going to accept you more. And that there was not <laughs> one thing that I could do better, not one thing that I could do worse that would make his acceptance greater or or worse That's than it. me. Because yeah. even if he's not pleased with me, he still is accepting me. But you're still his son. Right? This yeah. that's, doesn't mean because he's not pleased with me. If I didn't do something with perfect faith, yes. it doesn't mean he's not, he doesn't love me. Right. I he love still that. loves me, but he's just not, at that moment, for that circumstance, he's, it's not that he's not pleased with me. He's not pleased with how I'm acting in that moment. Yeah. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with me because he was pleased with me enough to come out of heaven to come in and, and, or, you know, to, to deal with me. <laughs> to send Right, Jesus. to send Jesus. So, so it's, we, we make it a personal thing. And that he just doesn't like me. Yeah. Well, no, he just doesn't like what you just did there. But it has nothing to are. do with you right. other than the fact that you were beneath what you could do in that moment. So there's no condemnation for that. There should be conviction to know, oh, that was living beneath my moment. That was living beneath me right there. Yeah. That's what conviction is supposed to do. It's supposed to help me recognize when I'm living beneath my potential. And I believe there's such deep hatred in the heart of God towards Satan that there's deep animosity, that if he sees that the enemy has a part of our lives, think about your child. You know, I love how Jesus brings it back to, well, you earthly fathers, you wouldn't give a scorpion or a snake, right? So how much more your heavenly father? So he wants us to constantly compare because it makes no sense what the devil does. Because if you do compare it to how you would be with your children, you would never reject them because they made a mistake. Instead, you oh, get you spilled more. the milk, you're out of here. Get out yeah. of here right now. Or even no, a worse do thing, that. like a really a bad right. thing. Yeah. Then your first reaction would be, I'm going to help them out of this. I'm not going to let the ha devil have them. Right? We tell our kids all the time, we're not ever going to give up on you. We will never let the devil have you guys. Never. It's just not going to happen. Why? Because there's a deep hatred in me for the enemy, and I don't want the enemy to have one part of our children. Well, the father feels the same way about it. He doesn't condemn us, 
He just doesn't want the enemy to have us. And I love that because the perspective is it takes it out of, am I right with you? Am I okay with you? Am I okay with God? We really immediately go and blame the one that started the whole problem, the devil. Yes. The devil is the one. I mean, and when you take it and you put the blame on him and you take it off of that person, it really helps the recovery. Yes. That's the restoration of meekness. Yes. When it's like, okay, we know if you didn't have a tempter, you wouldn't do it. That's right. None of us because would. that's the that's the nature of of man is that we need to be tempted to do it. Yeah, there is. There was no in us just to go and do it. God didn't right. put that nature in us just to go and do it. So anytime we are doing something that could be condemned or convicted, yes. it's because the tempter has been involved. Yes. And the other day, the Lord showed me that he is a, was anointed to magnify God, but he still magnifies so he magnified even the fruit on the tree, like this is going to make you as wise as God, which is not true because right. none of us are as wise as God now, even though we have all be been born in that sin. So he magnified the fruit, and that's a temptation. He magnifies clubbing. It's so fun. He magnifies drinking. It's like the best. He magnifies like if you can just have sex with that person, you're going to be like hitting the jackpot. He magnifies everything. And none of it is true. None of it is true. It is, it is not even 1% of that, you know? And so he magnifies everything so that we would be tempted because we think it's now really, really important that we have it. Even the love of peers. Okay, I, I am still connected to one girl that I grew up with in high school. And I'm ministering to her. That's all it is. So making those relationships that important is really from the devil, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's the same with, right? Even, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Now, as an adult, you can say that is ridiculous. But in that moment, the devil is magnifying the importance of that to your child and to your youth. And so we need to teach them that, too, that the devil is a magnifier. That's his anointing. And he wanted to magnify himself. So he fell. And now he magnifies all these temptations. So condemnation comes because you are constantly evaluating whether or not you are lacking something, right? You're lacking this, I'm lacking this, I'm not doing this right, I'm not doing this right. Mm -hmm. So Peter comes back and he says, the way to handle this atmosphere or this corrupt world, we, we saw a little bit of it this weekend, he says you have to add to, right? Yes. Add to your faith. So it starts off with, first of all, start pleasing God, not with your actions, yes. but with your faith. Yes. So add to your faith. You add it with faith. So you fa and then you have faith and then you have virtue and you have knowledge and you have brotherly kindness, and you have all these yeah. different things. But he's yeah. saying you can actually change your perspective on life by being an adder instead of always looking at what you have lacked or subtracting, right? Yeah. Adding, adding. And then he goes on, and this is where I really want, he says, um, um, verse 8, it says, if these things are yours and abound in you, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted. That's the key word right there. That's what condemnation is. It's short-sighted. Yeah. You can only see what you're in. You can't see further than that. Yes. You can't see how you're going to come out of it. You can't oh, see good. what the next level is. You can't see that God has bigger plans for you than in this moment. This moment can encapsulates you. When I was when I really, really dealt with condemnation, there was really no other moment. I knew God had prophetic <laughs> words on my life. I knew all this stuff, but there was really nothing else. I was drowning in my condemnation. Yes. I was drowning. I was literally overwhelmed in thing. a room, stuck in condemnation, stuck in the woes of my own failure and my insecurity and my inabilities and my lack of pleasing. And, right? I was just overwhelmed. And you know, I'm just telling you as someone that has the eyes of looking out of it, yeah. I was overwhelmed with it. And so at that point, only thing that mattered was I'm, I'm just such a failure. Yeah. I'm such a loser. And then everything began to pile on it and tell me 
the same thing. And then I go yeah. back to all of the things. Because if I wasn't a loser, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have sunk when I was walking on the water. And I wouldn't have said, I'll be with you forever. And then all of a sudden, I deny him and run away. You go through all <laughs> those things. And you wake up in the middle of the night and you're rehearsing. And says, man, then all of a sudden, I, now I'm going to have to, I'm not even going to feel worthy enough. I've got to be, I've got to die on the cross upside down. Because, I mean, that's still condemnation. <laughs> He's still talking about dealing with. Right. And the way Peter died, he refused when they crucified him. He refused to be crucified in the way that Jesus was crucified. He wanted to be crucified Worse. upside down. Because he has to be still has to pay the price for what he has done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul Because you're too, overwhelmed with it. You're concerned with this, this life that you have given yourself over to. And so you become short sighted. If you start to if you start to notice even if you don't feel condemnation, but if you start to notice that you can't see further than a moment, yes. then you are condemned. Yes. That's not conviction. That's the Antichrist. Conviction spirit. helps you see further than what you're in right now. Yes. Helps you see what it's going to look like and feel like to be free. Yes. Condemnation doesn't help you feel like what it <laughs> look and see what it feels like to be free. No. It only tells you how condemned you are. So you, when you're condemned, all you see is this is how it's going to be forever. Yes. When conviction comes, your eyes are not short. Your eyes are far seeing and yeah. you go, oh, man, I'm going to get past this. This is only a day. This that is only is a moment. So I've already. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I'm coming out of this thing. That's and why so, testimonies are so important. Yeah. I mean, we are friends with pastors who used to be homosexuals. I know uh, ministers who used to be prostitutes. I know uh, people that were abusive that are now awesome men and women of God. There is no you can't go too deep. For God to be not greater than that. Amen. So so the devil wants to say you're mocked forever. You'll always be this way and there's no way out. But there are amazing. If I even think about myself and my siblings, some of the like really bad stuff. Right. I mean, they did worse stuff than me, really. But anyway, I don't just mess it. Well, no, they really did. But. <laughs> I was the youngest, so I learned not to do some of the stuff they did. But it was all bad in the eyes of God, right? Even like stealing licorice, it's all bad. So, um, but s some of the stuff I would think, oh my gosh, you've ruined it for life now. Now you are always this kind of a person. You're always, you know. But it didn't ruin it for life because Jesus is greater and his blood is greater. And I don't relate to them like that at all. I relate to them as men and women of God who are ministering all over the world. Right? It doesn't even, it's not even a part of the picture. Right? That was just what they did in their youth. And thank God for his saving grace. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And they learned from it. Right? So it doesn't weigh. But in that moment, that's all there is. There's no way, way out. So, so when you hear a young person talk about how they can't see their future, you hear a young person talking about how they don't know their purpose, then you should know that they're struggling with condemnation. Yes. They can't see because they're short-sighted. Yeah. Their sight is only about what is self-gratifying right now. That's why they give in to the things with their friends. They give in to the things that are immediate gratification right now because they don't have long-term vision. Does that make sense? Yeah. So be aware, be aware that when you are, when you're dealing with them and they start talking about being uh, short sighted, that that is that is very important that they may not be expressing the feelings that they're having, but because their eyes can't go further than than a, a little yeah. bit, they're, they're struggling. So their eyes are not on the promises of God by which we. Uh, what's the word? The knowledge, right? Be they're unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus, knowing who he is, how gracious, how powerful he is to transform and redeem. Right. So then they are become short sighted. That's so intense. So this is second Peter one. Yeah. Verse nine. So in, and then it then it goes on short, short sighted, even to the point of blindness. So wow. this is this is important that we realize that if we have a the Bible talks about a generation that is blind to the things that is blind. You know, they, the spirit of the sage has blinded them. Yeah. He's blinding them with condemnation. Yeah. He's blinding them with 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 fear of their future and fear of being rejected and fear of not being accepted, which is 
very hard to allow conviction because you're so blinded with your own with your own perspective and own life. So he says, even to blindness and has forgotten. This is Peter talking, which I love. And has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. That he has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So he's saying, you've already been cleansed. Once and for all. And so we need to help them understand that you were already cleansed from your old sins. The old ways of falling short and the old ways and help them remember. It's a, re- it's a remembrance of, of being cleansed. Yes. And so this is what Peter's saying, how he has encountered condemnation and how to get free from it. If I can just show you one more thing in John. I can remember that spot. Just real quick. But it's in John 3, and it says, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we go, yay. And this is how we get cleansed from our old sin, right? Our old sin is cleansed because he has come to give us everlasting life. It is completely handled. Yes. But we stop there. We stop there. For verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So condemnation is a feeling that I'm not saved. Yeah. Because you have not partaken of the promises of God, so you are not a partaker of the divine nature. In your yeah, mind. you forget that you are cleansed yeah. but and given everlasting life, life that is always going to su- be superior to whatever the moment is right now. Yes. You're going to keep living. This feels like you're falling apart and that your world is ending, but you're going to keep on living because yes. this life that Jesus gave you is not for this moment. It has a far seeing, even yes. to eternity, yes. right? This is the difference. Then when you think that this life that you're living is for this moment right now, then you give in to things that you get condemned for, yes. and you don't. It, and then you don't allow conviction to get it out of you. Conviction is, is saying, hey, you live further than this moment. Go ahead and drop this and let's go on. Yes. And and so we forget Come those things. And we need to be reminded to th- of these things. Yes. And uh, he goes on and he says, uh, let me see, condemn the world. Uh, he who believes in him is not condemned. Right. So there's the key. Our faith is being challenged because you have to have your faith and then add to your faith yes. and then add to your faith. So you're always adding stuff to your faith to believe in him. So when you feel like, Someone doesn't love you. You add brotherly love to your faith. You're doing it by faith. If you feel like you don't have the meekness, then you add meekness because you're adding to your faith. All those things you're doing by faith, you're not doing them because you feel it. Because this is the reason I keep saying feeling, 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 because condemnation is a feeling. Mm -hmm. Conviction is a feeling. If you don't allow the feeling to happen, then then it must it will go away. If you don't allow the feeling of condemnation to go to happen, then how do you get rid of it? You get rid of the feeling of condemnation right. by the promises of the Lord, right? By it's by the goodness. understanding that but then you have to add it. Add what you're missing. So add what you're missing. So if you feel condemned because virtue, right, you lack virtue, I just am not a virtuous person. Man, I was so quick and short with them. So just start adding it. That handles the condemnation. Yes. So you add it by looking at <laughs> Jesus. Just start adding it. And you're transformed into his yeah. nature. And you start saying, I am a virtuous person. Just I am like a Jesus. virtuous. Oh, Lord, I, I just, I missed it there. I did that again. Well, just start adding it. Don't sit there and look up what's, what's subtracted, yes. what's missing. Just start adding. Then just say, I am a yes. person who was able to be Patient. strong there. Whatever it is. Yes. Because cause he says here. He says, it's, it's your faith. But he, he who believes in him uh, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. So it's just about how I believed or how I don't believe. That's right. When I believe that I'm a loser, then, of course, I'm going to be condemned. Right? Yes. Because that's not how he believes in me. Yes. My belief in myself is different than his belief in me, so I'm going to feel condemnation. Yes, it's so powerful because the voice of the Father was much louder for Jesus than the voice of the devil, right? So when we have a loud voice of God's goodness and we focus on 
how powerful he is, how gracious he is, how able he is to deliver us, right? Because, because we're really magnifying um, the power of that sin when we stay in it in, instead of magnifying the Lord and magnifying his ability to make us virtuous, patient, and all those things that but we're lacking. But he tells us to add it. Yes. Hey, you add it. Yes. Don't wait for me to add it. Right. We sit around and we say, Jesus, add virtue to me. He's given it by He's his like, promises. He's like, I have. I've given you everlasting life. Yes. Now just add it. Yes. Stop asking and start adding. Yes. Because <laughs> we sit around going, Jesus, will you make me more perfect? I already did. You are perfect. Just add it to it. Yes. Stop being so short-sighted. Go further. Mm-hmm. See, because even though he's loving, he does, he is direct, right? So, <laughs> but I want to, I want you to understand this as we only have five minutes again. I, I think me tag teaming with you doesn't help the, the, the time process. But, but this, so I, I was, when I first started ministry, ministering on the street, um, I was preaching on the streets and the, I, I, would, I came home after preaching one day. And I laid on the couch and took a nap, and I had a dream of a car coming off the road while I'm preaching and running me over. Voice comes and says, I'm going to kill you if you keep on preaching. I just, I wake up from the dream, shock, all just, you know, you know he's sweaty. I just said, you know, I, that's, that's ridiculous, and I just kind of ignored it and laid back down. Immediately, that same dream happens again. This time, I woke up, and I started meditating on it. This is how condemnation happens. You start meditating on the, the, what the devil says instead of meditating on what God says. And so I, I woke up, and I thought, oh, my goodness. And I started meditating on it, and I started believing it. And the next thing you know, I was gripped. It's a longer story, but I'm going to give it to you really quick. But, yeah, I was gripped by condemnation. I was gripped. I was already a person dealing with self-rejection, right, internal rejection. So he gripped, he held, he handled that. He, he, he yeah. grabbed a hold of that, and then he brought fear. It led me to anxiety. It led me to not just now, it's not just something you play with. You don't play with condemnation because it leads to anxiety. It leads yeah. to fear. It leads to trepidation. It leads to intimidation. Destruction. It leads to fear of man and fear of failure and leads yeah. to all these. Primary is fear. And so I was bound by fear. Only thing I could do, I couldn't go to work. I wouldn't go preach. And I wouldn't do anything but go to church and then quickly get home. The one time I did go, I started hearing voices. I mean, really flipped me into some amazing thing. So I'm at home and I'm watching television and we're almost done. But I'm watching television. I want you to know how to pray for a person with condemnation. You have authority over it. You have to realize at that point, I'm not just dealing with something internal. I am chained to it. You had a stronghold. I am, I am ch- chains are on me. Yeah. I am, if, so imagine chains wrapped around my arms and around my legs and chains around my head. I'm completely chained and restricted in life. There's things that I couldn't do anymore because I had condemnation that opened me to fear. And I'm bound and I'm chained. And all I could do is sit home and watch TV and all day long. And so Carlton Pearson comes on and he prays and I get set free. He prays against condemnation through the television. And I know the power of television. I know the power of prayer. And I know the power of this. I know the power of prayer. We're going to pray. All we need to do is pray one minute, and that's going to break chains. And the chains broke off of me. But the next morning, I opened my heart to the voice again. Yes. The voice of condemnation. He started talking to me. You're going to lose. You're going to do this. Who do you think you are being free? Got bound again for another maybe four weeks to another two months. James Robinson comes on and he talks about he breaking the chains of condemnation. He prays on TV again, TV yeah. in because I'm locked in my house. I don't do anything. And he prays, boom, and breaks the chains. He says, I'm going to break the chains once and for all. And the chains break. Yes. And I've been set free from that ever since. And it tried yeah. to visit me one other time, that spirit of fear, when I was in Africa. And I had to break the chains myself, wrestle with it all night long, broke the principality's chains on me. And I'm telling you, we're going to break chains off of a generation through prayer. We have to understand that they're already cleansed from their old life. If we don't think that they're cleansed from their old life and have a far sight for them, then we will only address what's short-sighted and not deal with their future and only try to handle their, their momentary afflictions. The future is the power. The future. So... 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we're going to pray that. Casting down imaginations, their lies, 
and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God has a knowledge of us that the devil doesn't want us to live in. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, of who Christ is and who Christ is in us. So we come against the spirit of condemnation right now in the name of Jesus. All those under the sound of our, of our voice, we bind your activities. We bind your grip. We bind your, your uh, voice. And we break your chains off of the people of God right now in the name of Jesus. We cast down every accusing voice and imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ in us, the knowledge of a newborn creation, the knowledge of us being above and not beneath, the knowledge of us be having power over all the power of the devil, and by no means shall anything harm us. The power of the knowledge that we are holy and righteous by the blood of the Lamb, that we are accepted in the beloved, that we are the children of God. And I break off every lie of the devil. Your identity is not found in your actions your identity is found in God alone. What he said, what he did, what he accomplished in you and for you in the name of Jesus. And we pronounce you accepted and loved by the Father. We pronounce you cleansed and washed by the blood of Jesus. We pronounce you free from condemnation. We pronounce you free from bondage and fear and rejection in the name of Jesus. And we declare that you are entirely free in your mind and in your soul, in your emotions, in your memory, in your nervous system, in your body, and in your spirit in the name of Jesus. Now we declare wrap yourself, wrap yourself in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Wrap yourself in the promises of God in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that we're going to live a high life, Lord. We're not going to be drawn down by the enemy anymore. We're going to stay seated on our throne. We're going to keep ruling, Lord. And we have full control over every feeling, emotion, and urge. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.